Hi everybody, Will Alexander here with this week's interview chair. The contestant is one Miss, Miss, Mrs. Shannon Shear. Haven't seen Shannon for ages, so you know what? This is going to be a great interview, and bear with me because we laugh a lot. All right, go to it, Shannon. Hi everybody, today we have on the interview chair, my longtime dear friend, Shannon Shear. Hi Shannon. Hi Will. How are you? I'm better now. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you though. I haven't seen you. Yeah, forever. same here. <laughs> We've spoken, but I haven't seen you. Um, how are things that going out there? How's Fred? He's fine. It's almost tree farming time. So oh, almost, right. almost snow is almost gone now, and we still got ice. We have no minus snow. minus two. Hey, <laughs> we have no snow. We have it's, we, we, we're we're lucky. Uh, uh, okay, let's get started then. Tell me how you got involved in dogs. First of all, tell me how old you were when you got involved in dogs. Then proceed. I was older than most of you. Um, Probably still, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that. But no. I, I beat you to it. Um, we didn't get our first dog until I was 15, and my uncle bought it. And back at that time, uh, Walt Disney, Big Red was a big thing. So, of course, I started with an Irish setter, just like yeah. everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and she destroyed my our house, uh, chewed through the walls, ate all the furniture, and then my mom finally decided maybe we should go to a dog show and see if there's obedience classes or anything for this dog. And I met Larry Kerluck and Sunny Tugas, yeah. and they took me over to the Irish Setter Club of Manitoba booth at the Northwinds Dog Show at the Convention Center. Where did um, you grow up? I grew up in Winnipeg. Yeah. So they introduced me to Elaine Vanderveer and actually her daughter now, Kim Hawks, is one of our top cardiologists, canine cardiologists out in Alberta. And I used to babysit her. <laughs> so because of her mom and Sunny and Larry, that's the reason I got into dog shows. Um, I started going to our cider club and we did classes and junior handling and back then, they had a novice class. So you could enter confirmation and go in the novice class, but you had to win three first before you could actually compete and go into open with your dog. You didn't get points for it, but you had to win. And I think I showed in that class for about a year and a half with my Irish setter and I never won. So you were she was a, your Irish setter in the novice class. <laughs> no, she wasn't a confirmation dog at all, but uh, Mrs. Vandeveer gave me a couple of her really beautiful Irish setters to learn junior handling on. And that's where I started and it went from there. So, <laughs> well, you, you, uh, you've become quite a, a you've been a, an accomplished professional handler for how many years now that's what happened you tell me <laughs> <laughs> where did you go from there where did I go from there from there um I dabbled in everything I did obedience I did field work uh my Irish setter and I we ran on the first scent and hurdle team in Canada um there was us and Do dogs in action and that was run by Gary Hazen and Shirley Hubenig back in Winnipeg and then we moved to Calgary. My parents got divorced and we moved to Calgary. And I, I just, we're, that's what we had. We had Dobermans back then. My parents were really heavy into Schutzhund and tracking. So I did a lot of hanging out there. And then we got into dog shows here and I joined the Alberta Junior Handlers. How old were you then? How old? I'm 15 when I moved out here. Oh, okay. Um, to Calgary. You were 15 for a long time. I was 15 for many years. Yeah, same with <laughs> Cody. Um, so then we came out here and I worked for some great handlers for many, many years. I, I uh, At the beginning, I started with Carol Graham. Um, Gary Hazen had moved out here and suggested 
you know, that I tried working for a professional handler if I wanted to really get into dog shows. And I was with Carol for a couple of years. And then I worked for Betty McKillop and Brenda, Brenda Coombs now, Brenda McKillop. Um, and then one of my very best friends is Taffy. And so I went on a couple of circuits when Taffy was working for Susan Hillman. Um, I just, I worked, I was probably an assistant for at least 10 years. And- yeah, That's unheard of time, nowadays. That's no, that is 10 minutes nowadays, <laughs> 10 days if you're lucky. But each of the people, the handlers that I worked for were top-notch handlers. Um, all the assistants, I mean, it was a great job. I loved being an assistant because all the assistants are now today's top-notch handlers. You know, that's it, you and Doug and Taffy and Kim Campbell. And, you know, we were all one big group and it was great. Michelle, Michelle Yaden, you know, there was so many of us that hung out together and all of us studied with different handlers and masters for many, many years before we decided to come become a handler. So that was, that was then, this is now. <laughs> so you, you worked for handlers. When did you, when did you decide to go on your own then? How long? Um, I had, when I worked for like every handler that I worked for, it was a great learning opportunity. They all gave me the chance to take one of my own dogs on the road, whether it was a client or one that I own, well, nothing I owned ever <laughs> needed to go on the road. Um, so I would take a client dog and um, sometimes I would beat my handler, my handler mentors and it was great. It was, uh, that's how I started. Um, I made friends with Merla Thompson. She's actually one of the very first people I worked for. She was basically a, a sighthound handler and I got into the world of Borzoi way back in no, oh, probably mid eighties with Merla and I owned a Borzoi. And then uh, Carol Graham was showing for Glenn Downey, the Calamar Kennels. And when I quit working for Carol, Glenn came with me. And between him and Rosenroy Singleton with the Dachshunds, uh, Bev Byron used to show those dogs, Bev with the uh, Otter Hounds. Um, all those people came and I guess believed in somebody that was it was 17, 18. I still worked for handlers, but that was my, my little hound string that I had and golden. So of course I had always had a golden from day one. I had a golden with me. So I went out on my own, probably not until I was about 23 around there, 24. Um, and then the one year, the, the great year we were, it was Doug, Shauna Bernardin, and myself. And we all traveled around in Doug's big gray cube van. And we were number one, number two, number three, all breeds that year, all three of us. Of course, <laughs> Doug was number one, of course, no, but, <laughs> but it's, you know, we, we would band together and, and travel with, as friends with everybody, Terry Taplin, you know, we all stuck together because back then, I think we all had our own vehicles, but a lot of times it was cheaper just to go with somebody else. And that's how that all started. And when, when did we first meet? It must've been in the, the late eighties, probably like 86 or 87. Yeah, probably uh, by the Cow Palace. Um, back then, the Oto Credit Valley, like back then, well, that was a long time ago. I don't I know. know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> A long time, at least 30 years, oh, at least. Easy. Yeah, we're dating ourselves now. <laughs> <laughs> who, who would you consider your mentors in the sport then? There's a lot. There's a lot of people. And they, you know, they don't necessarily have to be professional handlers. They, you know, yeah. I think it's my mom at the beginning, she instilled a lot of... Uh, the ethics and the sportsmanship, you know, right from the get-go, uh, my sister and I, we would do junior handling and occasionally Alana would beat me. And if there was a little temper tantrum, I was not allowed to compete the next dog show and she stuck to her guns. So, you know, and your grades had to be good. And, but I think all the handlers that I worked for in, in their day, they were, you know, they were the 
glory, glory people. They were on top and you can learn from absolutely everybody. Um, and I've learned from my friends. I've learned from you. I've learned from Doug. I've learned from Taffy and Bill, especially until Bill's great idea was I should go work for Maripi at Montgomery one year. <laughs> and so off I went, not, not having a clue without it detailed. So yeah, that was a, that was a very big learning experience. I'm sure. too. Yeah. Thrown into the fire right away. <laughs> but I, I've tried everything. So, and then you get into your, your little niche that, you know, the, the groups that you feel the most comfortable with. You, you know, you can be an all breed professional handler, but there's also, you know, a good handler will draw the limits on what they know and what they can do instead of flubbing your way through it. So that's, that's an important part too, is know where your niche is. Whether or not you want to, yeah. yeah. People know what you can do and how what you feel comfortable doing. Like I remember, I would call people. If I got a new dog, I would call who was good in that breed and ask them questions. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the breeders, um, you know, like you've mentioned in previous little interviews, I think the the breeder owners were probably the best mentors because it was consistent, and consistency is something that's the most important in a dog show, not ribbons. It's producing consistently and always having your dog presented to the very best. And the breeder owners that are that were back then and now, well now we have some really, really amazing breeder owners. They're dedicated to just one breed. And those are the people that the professional handlers fear, as far as I'm concerned. And they're the best people to learn breed specifics from, you know, I, yes. I, I believe. You, you've uh, to tell us some of your most favorite dogs that you, you've shown. Oh, that's that's a hard one to say. I know because they, they come to your mind. You know, it, it, there's no, it's not, there's no slight if you forget somebody because you know. Oh, oh I know, I know. Girl. God forbid I should forget somebody, <laughs> but yeah, the the come to mind so will be the the amazing Standard Schnauzer Fletcher. Oh uh, yeah. That that dog, um, the English Setter Cord. Uh, you're putting me on the spot here, you know, that the recent, more recently, uh, the Borzoi Boo, he was an incredible dog. Um, Mercy, the Sealy Ham of Tom and June's. Yeah. You know, there's, there's been, you know, like you, I've, I've had a dog in the top 10 for so many years and they've all been worthy of being there. Um, Tom, the golden retriever, uh, you know, is, over, over all those years, the, the funny thing is, you know, in, on all the breedings, I've won multiple best in shows on our dachshunds. Um, and I've won probably, the last time the Golden Retriever Club of America had asked and I had counted over 200 best in shows on Goldens, but I had never won one on my own Golden. I've bred <laughs> best in show winners, but I'd never won one because it's really hard to campaign your own dog when you have clients and then 2017 that was my very first best in show on, on my own dogs on a golden retriever so you know it's uh there's just I don't, know, I don't know there's so many dogs that were great and they don't necessarily have to be in the top 10 you know this oh, for sure. yeah. they could just be your normal little house pet you know I have I have a great dog right here. She's my 15 year old standard smooth dachshund. She's still going strong. So I put her in the same category as a top 10. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't remember what you were showing. You remember the time when I flew out west? I was with Doug and you were there because I, 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 maybe the first time we really got to know each other, I was showing the impresario dog beef. Oh, you, Lethbridge. Was it Lethbridge? Oh, you was at Lethbridge? Yes, yes. Um, Mishka Tick Brian Baru. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the weekend. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, that's probably the first weekend. Yes, okay. So, <laughs> I do remember some things. <laughs> Leave it at that. No. <laughs> that would be the weekend. Yeah, I thought it's probably when I realized, hey, you're kind of fun. No, <laughs> you're kind of intense. No. <laughs> that weekend, I wasn't usually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I forget. I I remember, um, not yelling at you, but yelling to you about <laughs> taking some pictures or something. So, 
Oh, was, yeah. I was so mad. I was so bent out of shape over what was happening. I said, you take some pictures for me to see who's rink stewarding and blah, blah, blah. It all had to do with that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I, I took pictures because I was, I was incognito. Nobody really knew who I was back then. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, the woes of losing one best breed in 200 days, yeah. I know, I know. It seemed like it was so important back then. <laughs> I know, but I, I think, you know, I think we we're all like that. And I think we have all, like, calmed down a whole lot now as, as we got older. It's, Even uh, <laughs> uh, Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, maybe. <laughs> but, yeah, it used to be a life and death matter, you know, it was... How we got away with some of the stuff we got away with saying, yeah, I don't know, because that's not happening now. But no, exactly, okay. we go through. I was talking with Dougie about stuff like that we didn't record, like about the voodoo dolls and the pennies and whatnot. They didn't <laughs> do those things anymore. <laughs> yeah, but that's what made dog shows so much fun. <laughs> oh, I know we had a lot of fun, but it was. <laughs> but it also, yeah, we tipped quite a few people over the edge there, so. <laughs> <laughs> um what about dogs that you wish you could have been a part of like is there is there dogs that have stamped their their legacy on you that you you refer to now when you see like not dogs you've shown but other breeds that you wish you oh. could, would have maybe shown or could have been a part of there's so there's so many there's uh well that's why we're here to learn them shannon well yeah yeah i know but now you think I'm going to remember their names? No. <laughs> no, I, um, no. Okay. Well, I have no going. answer. Edit. Have no no. Answer. Everybody has an answer to that question. Dogs they've seen. <laughs> want me to call, want to call a friend and I'll send you an answer. Yeah, yeah, let me call a friend. Well, yeah, no, that's sort of like naming, naming all your favorite dogs too, though. It's just a, it's a hard question. <laughs> well, what, what dogs did you really enjoy watching as you were growing up? As I was growing up, well, I can't even remember that far back. The ones that I enjoyed watching. Um, I remember uh, going to the show. Well, we always went to the show of shows and that's where the, creme de la creme in Canada showed up um and the the rip snorter dog that uh John Griffith well, showed John Glover so, or John John Glover sorry uh Schultz yeah that dog I really really liked that dog that dog was uh, a great dog um as far as showing no I've I've seen a lot of handlers wheel like just beautiful poetry in motion and I know how spinny those dogs are. And it just amazes me how they can get that out of their dogs. You know, that's the same thing, you know, like beef, you know, it's, it's um, not so much, I think the dog, I think it's teamwork that would be more of a standout in my mind than actually, you know, picking that dog, uh, say Spirit, the giant schnauzer with Taffy. I mean, that dog was an incredible show dog, but, to watch that teamwork with Taffy and Spirit, you never even really noticed Taffy in the ring because they were a perfect team. And it's the teams that really catch my eye more so than the actual dog and what the dog is a cap capable of doing. So and that's where I come from is, okay. is watching. Okay, yeah, that, how about, tell me this, when did you first meet Taff? I was, 15 don't <laughs> yeah 15 no, it no, no, year. no, no. <laughs> I, I was, happened that year <laughs> i was probably i think i was around 17 mm -hmm. and then that's when we were doing all all the circus then and susan was at the height of her career and she was there all the time susan and jimmy and kim campbell and taffy and david and you know that's how i met everybody and i was always so scared to to go talk to Taffy and I had her on this big high pedestal and everybody wanted to be like Taffy. We right? still do. We still have I know, but she's just like a normal person. She's as crazy <laughs> as all of us. But you know, then we just started, you know, a big pen pal friendship. I still have letters written on her unicorn paper that she wrote me when she was 18. And you know, it it just 
it blossomed from there. I was her bridesmaid, she was my bridesmaid. And it's just been a, a lifelong, we don't see each other a lot at all, but it's just a, a friendship that you pick up as soon as you left off sort, sort of thing. So, and she taught me a lot. She, she would be another one of my mentors. She taught me an awful lot. And I was stupid enough to go down and work work in the poodle kennel. Oh, I want to learn poodles too. And, you know, as far as friendships and, and a work relationship, I mean, it was great. Like, I didn't know how it would work, but it was, it was good. And yeah. you learn a lot and you learn a lot quick when you're with people like that, you know, they, they don't have time to screw around. <laughs> That's so neat. I think we just said about her being a pen pal. We don't have those anymore, really. You know, we have no people but pen pals here, like getting letters in the mail. That was amazing back then. <laughs> yeah, that's why I kept them. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you first meet Bill then? The day of the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> was it really? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, oh. Bill Bill would come up to a lot of the BC shows prior, obviously. And, but I was not ever in BC. I mean, BC is 12 hours away from where I live. So we were only out there when there was big circuits and I never saw Bill. So yeah, I met him the day of the wedding. <laughs> you guys used to drive through those mountains. I remember we followed you one time through the mountains. I remember you sitting on the floor oh of the God. mountains crying. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done it since. I'm like, I want to see the mountains. I'll just get a, mo a postcard and look at it. <laughs> Yeah, back then it was a, a little cargo van. Now I'm driving an 80 foot rig through those mountains. Well, it used to. <laughs> yeah. Crazy yeah. Mm -hmm. So what about uh, superstitions then, Shannon? Oh, yeah. Isn't that horrible? Isn't it horrible that we all have that? Um, the, big, the biggest one is <laughs> if, if you're driving to a show and you see a rainbow, you're going to have a really, really good weekend. Or if you're driving home from a show and you see a rainbow, you've always had a good weekend. It's never not happened. And also the elastics, which I got a lot of people turned on to the elastics. You have the same elastics over and over and over. And Chilly. if they're good ones, but if they're bad ones, you have to get rid of them. But the good ones, I mean, you'll be running around the ring and all of a sudden you feel one of the 12 that are on your arm snap and, and <laughs> panic sets in. You're trying to tuck it into your armband so you I've, don't lose I've, it. I've tied them together before. <laughs> yeah, see? No. Ridiculous. <laughs> but those are, those are probably, yeah, that's probably about the same. Um, my campaign dogs always have to have the same bed every, every dog show. I guess clean and it could be falling <laughs> apart <laughs> but i'm re-sewing it if they've chewed it but it's bad luck if you switch crate pads or beds halfway through a campaign year and always the same lead on campaign dogs yeah. and god forbid if one of the assistants puts a campaign lead on a class dog then i tend to lose it but you know, I'm, I'm getting easier on that now <laughs> mostly because i don't have an assistant <laughs> I, I tried that for a while. I could never get into the lead thing, and, and like I don't even so know Miss P's lead. Well, I, none of my none of my lucky leads. They don't have any of those beads or bangles or sparkles now. I mean, my lucky leads are from the 1980s. So I'm sure you know one day I'm going to be going around the ring, and that little clip is going to go, and then I'll be tying the lead to the collar. But yeah. So yeah. Um, let's let's change directions here. How about? Uh, you were around when the CPHA, the Canadian Professional Handlers Association, first reformed. It, reformed. It, yeah, because we did have a PHAC, and then it, then that was back. Yeah. Brian Taylor was the president, and and, and Garrett uh, Garrett was in there, and yeah. yeah, they had they had originally brought yeah. that and to we the called, board. They called it the PHAC back then. Then we started. A, well, we didn't. Um, it started again. I I think that uh, Richard and Susan Hillman, and it was the early, early 1990s when they resurrected. Yeah. Was CPHA. it the early 90s or was it, you know, I guess it would be early 90s. Yeah, it was, yeah, probably, yeah, early. So what's happening now with the CPHA, the Canadian Professional Handlers Association? Because as far as everybody's concerned, that's you. You're the one that controls it all for us. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, I know it's just sheer PHA. 
Um, we kept it alive. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I, I tried to. Uh, we we did. We went into a lull there for a few years where where nothing was done. Um, and right now we're you know we're starting back up. Uh, COVID actually gave you know a lot of insight as to um, needing an association like that and also having the time to do it. I mean, it's, it's really hard when it's not a huge membership, but it's very limited on what people are able to do. And most of the time prior to that, when we sort of slid out of the limelight, everybody's on the road, everybody's busy, and it's really hard to, you know, upkeep on a, on a website and, um, you know, just get your membership dues paid. Uh, we're still, we were pretty strong in, in the West always. I mean, our membership has not wavered in the West. We've always kept up. Um, I hate to say it, but the West is the one that does all the fundraising for all the charities and in order to put the top dog dinners on, which is basically what the CPHA has been known for in the last, maybe, the last 10 years, I mean, prior to that, we've had top dog dinners for probably 28 years now. Uh, we were first sponsored by Loblaws and then it went on. Now Prina is our big sponsor, but now more so it just seems like, oh, CPHA puts on the top dog dinner and that's the end of what the CPHA stands for. And th that's not what it stands for. We just, I think we just fulfilled a need that because our dogs, after the top dog dinner, the previous one with the President's Choice one uh, dissolved, we, we just didn't have a, a, a showcase for our top dogs. We, there was no. a certificate in the mail. So I don't remember who, was it Richard? I don't know who it was that decided we were going to at least have a, a water's dinner for these dogs. I think, I think it, was, it was Richard that started that. So, I mean, then the first ones, which was great because they were always, always held at year end at the Sky Dome. Yeah. And that's where everybody knew that. And the Junior Handling National was always at Sky Dome and, you know, times change and Credit Valley changed and, you know, those circuits changed and air travel changed. You know, back then we could, we could fly big dogs, no problem. And strings of dogs. You know? So, you know, then we, we decided to rove the dinner and we, we were doing pretty good on that for a while. Um, and then the expense, I mean, back when we could fly 14 dogs on a pallet on Air Canada was no problem. And then back then, you know, it, it started to turn into whether it was an Eastern dinner or a Western dinner. Uh, we were lucky enough to have some of the East people that were being awarded come out to the West, not all the time. So, but the West people, it didn't matter where that was. When we had it in Halifax, I mean, all those Western top dogs were, were partiers. We'll go anywhere for a good party. So you know, that's, that's a, what basically I tried to keep that part of CPHA alive. But now, you know, now it's, uh, we've had a year to think it over and we're starting, we're starting on a new website. The memberships are, co are coming in and, you know, like we said, everything is regulated and you don't necessarily have to have a big kennel facility to be a CPHA member, as long as you stick to our code of ethics. And if you only show three dogs or, you know, you're limited to what you have on where you live, those three dogs do not have to be in a kennel facility. They can be your household dogs, which is what a lot of handlers implement. You know, that not everybody lives on an acreage where they can have, you know, 14 kennel runs, but those people are not the people that claim that they do show 14 dogs on a weekend. They don't, they travel with three dogs and those three dogs live in the house with them and that's totally fine. So I think a lot of it is, um, mistrued on on the qualifications on whether or not people could qualify and of course they have to be regulated by two long-standing members that have seen their facilities or their their vehicle or the care you know basically it's not how many ribbons you win it's the care of the dog and the knowledge that you have and right now you know I think people pretty much know you know who to who to turn to and they watch people at the shows and this is aimed more to 
not fly by night, so to say, but for the, you know, the juniors that they just, they get out of juniors at 18 and boom, they're a professional handler. Uh, just because you've worked for a handler for two weekends does not constitute you as a professional handler. You can say you're a handler, but not a professional handler. And, you know, like they think it's easy money and, and most of them, you know, they're, well, I can't say most of them. I'm talking for what I see out here. I don't see all across Canada, but you know, they don't have a vehicle They meet dogs ringside and sure it's easy money, but they have no idea how to even present that dog. And they'll go in and they'll win ribbons. Of course they'll win ribbons because you know, they're probably ace junior handlers, but maybe it's the, the old ways on my thinking. I just think you need to pay some dues before you can say that, you know, you're of some professional level which is where the CPHA would, would come in as far as people that were, were mentored and people that have, you know, dog knowledge and basic canine care. Yeah, that's the part that concerns me the most. Um, fancy vehicles, smoke and mirrors, anybody can do it. But maybe again, I'm just jealous over the fact that we all work so hard as assistants. <laughs> now you don't have to, no. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you pay them enough money. I remember being an assistant and not even know if I was getting paid or not. So. <laughs> exactly. I, I was an assistant for two years before it was Taffy that said, you know, you get paid. What? I didn't know that. No. <laughs> I got to take a dog with me and show a dog for, for free. I mean, that was the best trade-off ever. Oh, no. And you work your butt off. <laughs> now you ask somebody if they want to work, well, how much are you paying? It's like, <laughs> what are you My paying? Very <laughs> My very first check was a check off of uh, the Saskatchewan circuit, the killer circuit. And Betty McKillop gave me a check and I didn't even know what to say. I was looking at it. I'm like, what is this? I don't even have a checking account. No. <laughs> well, I really, when I worked for Gary, I would get, I would get a check like every six months, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, here's your check. <laughs> I know, but back, we did it because we wanted to do it. It wasn't, wasn't about the money. I mean, back then I still had three other jobs going too, but you know, it was just, oh, you get to go to a dog show. And now it's like, oh, I have to go to a dog show. Well, actually, I'm getting excited again. Maybe maybe they'll start, but oh, we'll see. Maybe they won't. We just got some postponed, so. Yes, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, out West, we're, we're pretty used to the shutdowns. You guys haven't had as many shutdowns as we have, but now our our premier he just gave up he said nobody will listen anyway so it's like you know we're rolling with it but I, we've had we've had uh one show day and that was naca last june in 18 months out west and that's that's all the prairies and bc and the island so at least you guys have had some shows yeah we had some in the fall and we were so, cold though we were because we were outside <laughs> We had them. So back to the CPHA. Um, now, if a, a young mayor, a young um, handler to be wanted to join our CPHA, what did what, what what do we ask of them before they join, and what what can we offer them? We can offer them many things. We can offer them mentorship, whether they want it or not. <laughs> um, um, if a young person wants to join, I mean, it's it's not like an elite society group, you know, like Depo Society or anything like that. It's uh, something to the fact it's, we teach. I mean, I don't, I can't, every single member that we have is so involved with junior handlers as it is, um, as far as teaching handling classes and stuff like that and, and juniors and teaching juniors and judging juniors. Uh, we welcome young people in definitely. And, you know, like I said prior, you don't need to have a big fancy sprinter or a cube truck. You know, if you do go to the shows, if your mom takes you or somebody takes you and you show dogs there, it'd be nice if you started with, you know, your own setup and knew how to groom the dogs that you were showing and, you know, didn't just do ringside pickups. Um, most of the the young, the really young handlers, not really young, you know, I'm talking 18 to 25. That's sort of when we all decided what we wanted to do, you know. Um, those, 
they've already proven themselves, I think. And it's just a matter of um, they're ethical. I, I'm not downtrodding a whole bunch of youngsters. There's no, just a not. few. Yeah. So, you know, there's just a few that I, that I see and I shake my head because, but I mean, people hire them. So you get what you pay for. Well, I, I like the fact that I'm a, I'm a member as well. <laughs> but I, I like the fact that we are basically ethical advisors to a lot of them. And I, I, I like it when they call me and ask me an ethical question. I think that takes a lot for them because nowadays most kids think they know in the, in the real world, not just our world, think they know everything. And um, so I, I, I think it's pretty big of them and for them to be able to call and then say, hey, what would you do in this situation? Or um, what would what yeah would the only the only calls I get are from people my age is this ethical yeah no <laughs> nobody out here would is really into that point because like you say they already know everything so I usually tell them if you have to ask yourself that question you probably have the answer too <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good point that's a really good point yeah it's true you know, I think I, I I really think that our organization is good for the younger handlers if they want it to be. If they don't want it to be, they can just go off on their own and, and fly by the seat of their pants. But if they want to follow what the CPHA has written for the last 30 odd years, I think it, it, it's good for them. They're gonna, they're gonna learn what it takes to be one of us. Or I, think, I think it's good for anyone, not just a specific age category. And like you say, yeah, you can take off and fly by the seat of your pants and you will probably do just fine. Um, it's just trying to get people a little bit more um, involved in the sport that will stay in the sport. And like you say, can, can mentor the younger people. Um, you don't have to be, nobody's saying you have to be a CPHA member. We're just saying it's, something that is regarded a little bit higher than yeah. does that sound egotistical it, no, it might it's, it's more of a structure for us i think like i they, people realize that the one thing that like let's just take a for instance a hypothetical out of the sky someone undercuts somebody by a lot that ruins it for everybody it really does and because mm -hmm. it, it drops it, it drops the pay grade to that level for a lot of people and they want it like well, so and so only charged this much, and so and so only. It, it but those are, those are the people that you know they don't they don't have a vehicle, they don't have expenses. They go to free benching. I mean, out out west we pay for we pay heavy for benching and electricity all the time. Um, they never pay for that. They'll borrow a friend's setup, you know, so they have no expenses. So if they're charging fifty dollars a day as a client, oh, hey, they can they can do the same job that that one that's charging $100 a day, not realizing that our overhead is way higher. Plus we're paying, you know, hopefully top-notch assistants to work for us. We also, if we're carrying eight, eight to 14 dogs, we have two assistants. We're not missing dogs because, you know, it's a gong show back in the setup. You know, like I said, you get what you pay for. Um, but then some of the juniors out here, they're bang right out junior alley and they're charging $85, $90. I'm like, how did that happen? No. <laughs> they just got to watch for setting precedences with, with like, like I, I, it's obviously it's not a law for us up here, but like when dog is owed money and his handler is switching, the owner is switching handlers, it's ethically right for a handler to call that other handler and say, no, so-and-so called me and they, do they owe you money? Is there any money owing on the bill? We, we get a lot of, not so much, but they still have some out there that just forget that whole idea and just take the dog on, re not realizing that it, it's hard on everybody when you set, set that kind of precedence. It, it is um, ethical and polite to ask if it- And if we're it, Canadians, so we have to be polite. <laughs> yeah, eh, no, <laughs> if it, but I mean, if a client decides to, to change handlers and they do on they have, the right to, they have every right to they, of course they do and you know handlers have a right to change clients <laughs> and we have a right too and we yeah. do um but you know like it, it is ethically correct to, to ask but i can't remember where i was going with that because <laughs> <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> 
<laughs> Let's just go um, to the TV. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, but but yeah, I mean that it doesn't happen that much out here, and there. Oh, I know where it's going. Uh, <laughs> there's two sides to there's two sides to every story. Sure, there is. So yeah. even though one one handler may ask the other handler, "Oh, I'm going to take this dog, but I know you showed it last weekend. Is there money owing?" And that handler will say yes. I think it's up to the ind individual handler to make the decision on their own when they hear both sides of the story. You know, it, there could be some underlying reason why that other handler was not paid or why that handler got rid of that client. You know, it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's human nature just for people to be polite and to ask that. Like you said, you said before, CPHA is there to offer recommendations we don't, we're not the Gestapo and regulate because we can't. No. It's just what we I expect. Away, so. It's what we expect um, our members to stand steadfast and true and, you know, carry on as professionals. And, you know, it's CPHA was a, a lot was based on the PHA in the, in the U.S. And that seems to be working really well for them in the, in the U.S. But their membership is so much larger because of, the country well, sheer population yeah like our our per capita we are just like the size of texas <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, know. I know so yeah you know like we may only have uh 15 members but the majority of them i mean we're we're starting to get some you know some really good young good people in which is exciting i'm very excited about that um and a lot of the membership is we're in the 50 age plus category, um, but that's where we were when we were being assistants. You know, that I'm sure that's the age category that, you know, uh, Gary and Garrett and Susan and Betty, they were probably, you know, mid forties or fifties. And we thought, oh my God, they're old, you know, they've been around forever. The young man sport. <laughs> And now we're those people. So, you know, when you, when you welcome in new members, it's great because eventually, you know, we'll all be back at the shows together and that's when we can start not mentoring, but, you know, and overseeing yeah. and suggesting, you know, those are, those are good things. It's really good things. And that's how people learn. But a lot of people don't want to learn. Okay, that's enough deepness for a while. Let's go to some. It is. It is. <laughs> Tell me something. You brought it up. I know. So, what well, we had to get out of the way, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. journalism, <laughs> Shannon. It's journalism. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about any? Tell me some of the funny incidences that have happened to you in the rings or at the shows. And don't tell me you haven't had any because I know you have. <laughs> Oh, I'm going to repeat my answer. That's like asking me to pick my favorite dog. No. Yeah, well, no one's going to get hurt, hurt feelings over this one. Oh, we had more fun when I was with Shannon than that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's way too many of those. Um, <laughs> living at Tealwood for that whole year, I was on the Tom Cruise tour. That was that was probably the most fun I've, I've had. I stayed out in Ontario with uh, Golden and the Key Sound. Um, we had... A lot of fun lot times. Of <laughs> Driving through Tim Hortons when you swore <laughs> she heard you. And that just came to my head. Too. <laughs> uh, uh, when I was showing Boo and my sister was at home with a litter of dachshunds, so I was on my own. Um, and I was unloading my cube truck with my flip flops on, and I just had my nails done. And I hit the back of my cube truck, and I didn't want to break my nails, so I put my hands behind my back sailed across the gravel parking lot and these three teeth are fake because i knocked them all out and the next day i i i, I have pictures and it was like road rash all around no teeth in the bottom and john routon had given the borzoi peasant show and refused to get a picture because <laughs> i looked so bad um you know there's a there's there's a lot there's a lot too many. <laughs> they're all coming to my mind now and like like when I was yeah, um, off in Winnipeg and you sent left that left that, that thing in my setup. You have to be this tall and ride this ride. Oh, oh Winnipeg, yeah, when you jump the rebar. Yeah. 
<laughs> and we're, oh, we shouldn't laugh. It's not funny. Oh, now he's bleeding. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to the doctor, went to the emergency clinic, emergency at the hospital, and I told the inevitably beautiful receptionist <laughs> what happened. And I said, those girls back there think it's funny. And she said, it is funny. <laughs> it is really funny. Yeah. And again, that was that was you doing a junior handling seminar, and you were going to be Superman and jump the rebar. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I thought my inseam was was longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I was hurt. So. <laughs> uh, and then I don't know what Irish setter you were showing the year you were out at Renaissance, and I, Colin was showing one of your class dogs. It was for the breed. And that's when I, I was, I was out there and I was walking in with Jim Campbell and I had the tray of coffee and I flipped over one of those cement oh, girls, remember? Yes. I broke, oh my I broke my, broke my collarbone, broke my, <laughs> my wrist, yeah. broke my, oh my arm. God, remember that. Yes. And one rib, all that curing Tim Horton's coffee in the morning. Yeah. yeah. Did you smell them? <laughs> yeah. But I didn't want to wreck my Victoria's Secret boots. So I was watching my boots and I didn't see. And it was one of those big cement parking girders. It wasn't like a little. Oh, I know. You know. <laughs> and I remember Jim Campbell, Smitty, Smitty, are you okay, Smitty? <laughs> and then it was, I showed dogs for two days before I uh, went to the hospital That's in Vancouver. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, Crenna Valley, all those top dog dinners. Uh, remember Mary White flipping off the back of the stage? That was a good one. Uh, the top dog my trophy. <laughs> oh, then I broke David. <laughs> was it? Was it David's? David's you know, trophy. Mr. Deer's trophy. <laughs> yeah, <us>. yeah. <laughs> the framed framed ribbon. Yeah, when it <laughs> smashed all over the judges table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, you had to bring all that up, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The cell just started coming back to me. I haven't seen well, it. Well, it'll keep going. Yeah, it'll keep going. Yeah. I remember the set. You remember the shaving cream at the the center national? Okay. <laughs> and we called, California. We called yeah. Tuggy first thing in the morning. <laughs> People are gonna say you gotta go. You guys are telling us a story. No, we can't tell you this. Oh, we can't tell you the whole story. But yeah, no, I remember. Uh, um terry toplin and i we had gave doug a wake-up call at, in brandon at three o'clock in the morning and so we were in another room so we phoned told him it's time to get up he got up we heard the diesel start up he drove over to the building and it was only three o'clock in the morning do you remember when you guys used to mix up his clothes <laughs> <laughs> his suits were all set in his truck and you guys would mix the ties up and he would just put them on oh yeah i know he didn't care different socks and <laughs> in the years uh shauna was campaigning rodent the toy poodle and she was out for supper and i thought me doug terry it was at brandon again at the keystone center and uh we took we hid rodent and i went and bought one of those cooked chickens from the grocery store so i put it in the in the crate so it was warm and we put a little blanket on it and Shauna came back after a few drinks that supper and she reached in the crate and all she could feel was this warm chicken oh, and I'll never gosh. forget her face. It was just, oh, she I'm was sure. hysterical because she thought one of us had shaved rodent down. <laughs> and, then, and then the next morning I came into the show and took my winter boots off and put my show shoes on, which Shauna and Doug had nicely filled full of canned dog food. So yeah, you know, it just, just keeps going. Yeah, that's a fun back then. You know, now <laughs> it's just now that it's just, we're too busy. <laughs> okay. Or actually, now we'll probably get rode up if we pull stuff like oh, that. Exactly. Oh, I, I think it's one of the things I've said in the ring now. Like if I do that, if I did that now, I'd be like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. <sighs> what advice do you have for a young handler, Shannon? We're gonna get serious again. Oh, again? Yeah. Um, advice? Definitely, definitely. Stick to your guns and work for a handler. Work for somebody that you respect or work for a breed or owner with a, a breed that you are interested in. You don't have to necessarily work for a handler. It could be anybody, yeah. but stick to it. You know, three weeks or a month with one person, you're not going to learn anything. And start at the bottom. You cannot join ranks 
if you if this is something you want to do, you can't join ranks and be in the ring the next day. You start at the bottom. You're xing dogs. You're cleaning pens. You're washing crates every single day. You know, I've had kids where I'm like, you got to wash the crates. Well, I did that yesterday. No, we do it every day. Why? <laughs> Just because. <laughs> you know, so, and and have a, I guess now, something that we all should have had, have a backup plan. You know, not, it, nothing lasts forever. We thought it would. And it's now proven that nothing does last forever. You know, do you have a backup plan? I mean, some of us, well, all of us, we're all out of work, but we've all managed to survive the last year. Some barely, but I mean, the backup plan, whether it be grooming or you're working at Tim Hortons, I mean, you have to prepare yourself for the inevitable because none of us ever thought it would happen. So. Um, that, that leads me to the next question. What's hap What's going to be next for Shannon Sherry? Are you ever going to don the judge's cap and be a judge? Uh, I would like to, but I'm, I don't like their rules, put it that way. I don't like CKC's rules. I think there's way too many talented people that should be in judging. All, you know, ex-breeder or ex-breeders or breeders now or professional handlers. And yeah, I think we should have a, a stepping stone. I'm one of those ones that I don't want to do all that work. I don't want to memorize all those <laughs> all those uh, breed standards because you can give me a ring of 15 Irish wolfhounds and I'm going to find the top two for you in a matter of 10 minutes. I may not know the whole standard, but no, I I would love to. I judge sweeps in the states and sweeps here. I like that for my for my own chosen breeds. I love judging, but I am not going through all of that. So I can they're going to give me one group in four years, and you know I feel sorry for the permit judges that were just starting off. Now I mean, how are they going to get their numbers? There's no dog show, so they have to start over. The CKC has to rethink their their judging program because they're missing out on a lot of great people that feel the same way I do. And I don't want to be 75 when I get my fifth group. Yeah. So I, I know, I mean, there's seven groups. I know five groups inside out. And I'll tell you, there's two that I probably am, you know, I'm good with them, but I'm not comfortable with them, but I could take five groups right away and do a great job. I know it could, but I don't want to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we wish there was so many, like look at Harold, you know, Harold Butler could have ah, been away. He, gone all yeah. he just didn't want to, same thing, he, he didn't want to take tests and didn't want to do all that. And, and when you think about it, he's already given 60 years of his life to the sport. Why wouldn't the sport give him something back, you know? Well, that's what I don't agree. You know, I just don't get that, that aspect. And, but then, you know, the people that worked really, really hard and did all their tests and, and, you know, studied and did all their permits, I can see their point too. Well, why would that person get a, get a walkthrough? But, you know, like they tried to get, Jim Campbell was that emeritus, uh, you know, they gave him that where you could judge, then they took it away from him. It's like those, those people, you know, we do have great judges and we do have good ones coming up, but I think it takes way too long. And it's not, okay, maybe it's not so much the studying, it's the time frame in between. Yeah. You cannot do it as a, as a like You and I, uh, what are we gonna just stop making a living to become judges, you know, before we can- Yeah, you know. yeah, that's another point. You know, I still, I enjoy showing dogs. I, I, it's, it's never really been a job for me. It's just been something, it's, it's my life. I love showing dogs. And if I was starting to write, you know, I have, I have good friends like, you know, Nancy Anstruther and Kathy Cinnamon and, you know, all those people that used to help me show dogs. And now I'm like, here, hold this. Oh, you can't because you're, you're writing your, your, well, Kathy's got some groups and Nancy's um, in the States, but, you know, I can't even give them a dog leash to hold ringside when oh, growing up, we, we helped each other and they, you know, they were invaluable to me as friends. And now all they can do is make them suffer. And that's about the end of it, right? Because they're like, oh, 
we're, we wrote our paper, we can't touch your dog, you know, and I don't agree with those rules. I think they're stupid rules because how are people going to still be in the fancy? You know, that's like saying a judge can no longer breed dogs. You know, a, a lot of the judges we have are phenomenal breeders. Some have quit and some have continued on. And then they try and make it seem like it's a conflict of interest because uh, they breed dogs and they mm -hmm. might happen to put up somebody that they know, you know, and we're not allowed to talk exactly. to judges. In the no dogs still. Well, they got into it because they love dogs and love showing dogs. And now they feel uncomfortable showing dogs in their own ear because. Yeah. It's not fair because, you know, they want, they're still going to keen their, hone their interests on breeding good dogs. And yet they get backstabbed for showing their dogs. You know, it's. There's it. too many rules, too many rules that are well, stupid. It needs to be re reset. <laughs> it does, it needs, but I mean, that's never going to happen. Those are the rules and those are set and that's how it's going to be. Okay, one last question that I'll let you go, Shannon. If you could meet the 15 year old Shannon Shear again, <laughs> what would you tell her? This is a big span of 15 years, a 15 year old while you're there. So what would you tell <laughs> Shannon? What would you tell Shannon about the future? What about the future, about my 15 year old self? Her? What would you give her? Would, what advice would you give her about the future? Advice? Well, I'm not going to give any advice. What advice would you give the 15 year old Shannon? Now that you've been through Shannon's dog show handling career and you're still going, what advice would you give the 15 year old Shannon that wants to be a dog handler, wants to show dogs? What advice would you give her? I would just tell her to stick with it and hang on because it's going to be the best time you've ever had and the best years of your life. And what a great choice you made. No matter what your mother said. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no, no regrets. I, I love every minute of it. Still do. So I think I made the right choice. I had a lot of different careers before I decided, yeah, I was going to do this. But no, I, there's no advice. It's, if it's something that's in your gut and in your heart, stick to it. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. And if you're good at it, you'll still be good at it 50 years down the road. Well, good for you. All right, Shannon, I'll let you get back to work. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go charge my iPad now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, it was great to see you and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, thanks very much, it was fun. It was fun too, bye-bye. Oh, well, there you go, it was great to see Shannon. I told you we laughed a lot. So if you like what we're doing here, make sure you press the like, share and subscribe button. And if you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. And if you just want to know what's happening in Will's world, go to willalexander.net. Again, don't forget about the podcast. All of these interviews are on podcasts, on Dog Show Tips podcast. It's on Stitcher, Spotify, and Apple. And we also have a new one uh, called The Dog Show Drive with Wayne Cavanaugh and Will Alexander, the podcast about nothing. And it can be found on those same forums, Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple. All right, I got it all. See you next time. Bye-bye.